It's an irony for the ages how this pandemic, this time of unprecedented isolation, has forced us, virtually, to invite strangers into our homes. I have Zoom meetings with my uh, students, I, I, I broadcast my BBC radio programmes from here, and, and interviews and presentations and, and, and things all from here. Making us consider things about our domestic spaces we've never thought of before. I'm no expert, but trying to ensure that you see there's a mirror behind me that you can't then see, like, my boxes of cereal. For interviewers and interviewees, webinar participants and writers, suddenly it's all about the bookshelf. Let me to show you all the bookshelves. OK, there we go, up to the ceiling. A lot of people actually work in studies and have home studies, uh, and particularly the kinds of experts that are called upon in television uh, interviews to talk about areas of their uh, concern. You know, often they're situated in environments that actually are full of books. But at the same time, you can also see when a background has been really contrived. The bookshelf is multifunctional. It is somehow neutral and professional, yet also personal. It conveys messages about who we are and who we want people to think we are. Over 50 years ago, uh, uh, Irving Goffman, a sociologist, thought about how do we shift from thinking about the world as being like authentic or fake, uh, and instead, how is it more about being sincere or cynical? So he said, well, let's think about everything as a performance. Everything is like a stage play. I actually sit at that grey uh, chair, on that grey chair, but um, for the purposes of any kind of videoing, I like to have a nice colourful backdrop, so I use this, which um, I change according to who I'm talking to, by the way. And so what's really important is whether people are believing in that stage play or not. In fact, uh, the term impression management comes from Goffman's work, where we look about how people are selectively revealing things about themselves. There are pundits who want to signal like, you know, their authority by displaying very big kind of historical books or one of the most popular ones that I've seen on a lot of bookshelves is uh, Thomas Piketty's Capital classics as well. So people who have like all the volumes of War and Peace or the original classics in like Russian or French and stuff like that. Historically, in paintings and portraiture, Carefully chosen and placed visual props have long been used to hint at someone's interests, their inner world. Dogs can be symbols of fidelity or wealth. Fruit may represent bounty or desire. Specific books spell out a person's profession or confession. It wasn't until the 19th century that books for books' sake, large numbers of them, took on their own symbolism. The whole genre developed in the 19th century for literate, secular, male figures. And the books lent a kind of gravitas and expertise. For example, Edgar Degas, the French Impressionist, did a wonderful portrait of the critic and writer Edmond Duranty, where he seems to be completely enveloped uh, by bookshelves. When Manet represented Emile Zola, the French 19th century naturalist writer and art critic as well. He sits alongside a table which is piled with books. The same is true for Cézanne's portrait of Gustave Geoffroy. The credibility that books offer has given rise to a cosmetic industry. Platforms like Zoom allow you to customise your background virtually so you can adopt any bookshelf you like. If you want the real thing, but aren't too bothered about actually reading them, there are companies that sell books by the meter. They'll even curate your collection. Usually they cater to hotels, businesses, and the film industry. But the pandemic has led to a spike in sales to individual households. To me, those curated bookshelves and, and shelfies and things, they treat books almost as a kind of interior design. And much as I love books that look beautiful, I actually think it's much more important that they get read. You know, I don't think they should be commodified to the point where their appearance is more important than the contents. TV producers quickly learn that many of their interviewees working from home often don't have that many framing options. So we try and make suggestions. And we always ask if they have a bookshelf. Hello. 
because we know it works. I've become reliant on the bookshelf as backdrop for interviews, for lives and for pieces to camera. I generally go for this one for practical reasons. It's the right height and the lighting works, even if some of the titles might give off the impression I'm trying a little bit too hard. We thought about using this collection of magazine covers, but British pop culture from the 90s isn't exactly the Listening Post vibe, not to mention what it says about me. These shelves say a lot about the other part of my life. The colours and the covers are great, but I'm not sure they scream journalism. And I'm not the only one reading into what's on the shelf. Authors have always had their critics. Now bookshelves do too. Bookcase credibility attracts hundreds of thousands of followers. It reviews and rates backdrops, comments on trends, and, of course, draws all kinds of conclusions about the people parked in front of them. Jim sits in front of rows of his own books. Everything is Al-Khalili, and Al-Khalili is everything. These were simply the surplus that I didn't have room for in my library. I didn't really want to sh be showing them off. So they were just put up here out of the way. It's an immediately relatable concept. Um, and it's also a concept that's quite fun. Bookshelves based on, you know, how messy or how clean they are, the color schemes, the ways in which hardbacks and paperbacks are like, you know, separated or they're put together and what they say about a person. Maya builds a Mondrian out of her books and white space distilling credibility to its purest elements. I got quite a lot of flack for having a bookcase that was colour-coded. Some of the comments I've had are just like really, people are seem to be incandescent with rage or use it as like a way in to then critique whatever my analysis is. I think what makes bookcase credibility uh, so funny is the way that they extrapolate so much from so little information. One of their really brilliant tweets about Owen Jones where he has a couple of bookshelves behind him and they're described as being like, two henchmen who are sort of overseeing the conversation and, and policing it to make sure that it goes, the, goes Owen's way. And uh, I think they've got this wonderful way of sort of taking an element of truth and then just spinning it out into this almost a kind of a fantasia about what the character's about. Gideon Haig gives us a decent chance of guessing his favourite sport with this majestic display. It's simply because I face this way that you see my cricket books in the, in, in the background. And I think my head's sort of haloed by cricketers beginning with the letter B and C. But it's not because I'm particularly interested in those ones, it just happens to be there at a roundabout head height. Our presenter, Richard Gisbert, got the bookcase credibility treatment a couple of weeks ago, perhaps their way of declining our interview request. Richard Gisbert seeks to put us at ease, as if he's invited us back to his hotel room to see his credibility. If things go well, he might give us a song. I mean, they, they read a lot into the acoustic guitar, which I never play. All I do is play my electric guitar, my Telecaster, but our cameraman wouldn't let me use that because he likes the wood grain in the shots. So, you know, we make compromises whenever we make television. It doesn't matter whether we're in a studio or we're at home. People draw these widespread conclusions and there's very, very little flow that you or I can do about it. So Richard, do you agree with the credibility's assessment of you or do you think you want to contest it? I would say their assessment would be harsh, a little snide, but ultimately fair. <laughs>